Everyone's talking. Hello. 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 Ah, thanks. Ah. Right, so it's been pointed out that I am now the one standing between all of you at your dinner. So when the last person slurps out the door, I'm going to join you. <laughs> uh, so, quick audience survey again. Who has ever performed a bisection, binary or otherwise, in the audience? Okay, one or two. So, I'm just going to start with a, a quick introduction to what it means to perform a bisection. And if it bores anyone, I'm sorry. Um, and if you learn something, excellent. And I hope this will also be of use to any future QA members who might watch this on YouTube if I'm very lucky. Uh, so, something with a big introduction, followed by how to do it effectively, followed by questions, which will not happen because we'll all be down the pub having something. So, uh, bisection is a way to find bugs. It uses the uh, Git repository and it's a way of finding a bug in what may be a very large number of commits without having to test them all individually. And this is important for reasons which we'll come to later. And uh, Bjorn Michelson, who is not present, no, uh, originally uh, invented the system of binary bisection, by which we save you the trouble of compiling a hundred versions of LibreOffice yourself, mm -hmm. and simply provide you a repository which you can uh, use binaries from. So, to start with, you have to understand a little bit about how our Git repository works. Uh, there is a main stream of commits on the master branch, and at certain points, roughly every six months, hopefully exactly every six months, we branch off and go and have a release. And from that branch, there are sub branches which become part uh, of the like one and so on and so forth. And when we look for a bug, we usually have to look in this part in the master. Now, the reason why we might very much want to have to test every point of like bug is because we've got 10,000 people in each six months. It will take a bit. It goes up, it goes down. Here I've counted the ones that are on the master branch. In fact, sometimes we merge a few other little branches. Um, so just to make sure that in fact we've still got 10,000, if you count the merged branch, the invite over, we are just over 10,000 branches. And it's still. So how does it work? Uh, what we're doing is a binary search. So uh, when we start by knowing um, where a bug doesn't occur and where it does, that's what we have to know to begin with. We have to find some point in time before it happened and some time after. And between those, we take the middle and we test that one. And based on that, we can throw out half possibilities each time. And it turns out when you do that, uh, you can get even 10,000 in just a few tests. Um, so eventually we've gone left, gone right, gone left again. Uh, anyone who's done a bisect may know that it often tells you, in fact, always tells you, there are roughly a certain number of steps left. If you look at this, you can obviously see why, because when you get down to a few, any more choice you make, if it's a uh, a bad commit, then we're done. If it's a good commit, then we still want one more test to do. So it doesn't know ahead of time how many tests you have to run. Why? And finally, we get to the end. So, uh, the system that your Microsoft came up with was to save you having to compile all these commits yourself to test them. We pre compile a selection and commit them to the Git repository. It takes some space, but um, you only have to download it once for any number of bugs in the range of covers. And when you have all these binaries ready, you can test uh, a bug, find out uh, the region in which it's introduced in a matter of minutes rather than hours which is a great improvement. Believe me, we have a lot of bugs with all the help we can get. <laughs> and so, the original kind of Fibuset repository, back in the era when computing uh, power was just a little less than it is now, was sparse. And that means that for every certain number, every n source commits, we only build one binary. So every 32 or 64 source commits, we would have one binary in the Vivisage repository. Um, it's a lot better than nothing, 
but doesn't quite necessarily get you to finding out where exactly a bug was introduced. If you're lucky, you can figure it out. If you're unlucky, you still have to compile the source in that region. Um, most of those are now obsolete, but we have a, sort of a few that cover regions which aren't covered by any other repository. That's something I've been working on recently. Uh, so the, the amount, amount of time <coughs> that is necessary to use a sparse repository is a lot less than it used to be now. Um, so on so for the sparse we've set X the master commits, uh, but we only have a few what we say. Uh, more recently, I started building uh, fine-grained repositories where uh, there is binary for every possible commit that can be built, which makes it even a lot faster. No more source compiling necessary, provided that it could be built in the first place. We've been getting better at that recently. There's still a few percentage of commits which don't build. If you're a developer, please make sure they do. It helps a lot in the debugging. <laughs> so now, for every source commit, we have a set commit. Quite correct because every sort of two one of these won't build, so we won't have a new set for that time. <coughs> um, quick note uh, some of the older repositories, well not other, so some of the newer repositories for older periods of time have uh, recently built ones for the 4.1, 4.2 and 4.3 regions of history, but I built those incrementally. Uh, and that means without uh, making a clean build for each one, simply pulling and rebuilding each commit. Now, the build system Further back you go in time, less reliable it is. There may be bugs there. If you find, if you find yourself using two repositories, a pinch of salt may be necessary. Check that the commit to that one actually makes sense. But it's still a significant improvement on not having them. And we've managed to clear up quite a lot of very old bugs using these new repositories. Uh, so the main repositories we now have there are more than these, but these are the relevant ones. Um, this coverage starts about 3.5 region, about a year after the start of LibreOffice. Anything later than that, we have a good chance of finding where uh, a regression was introduced quite quickly. Anything older than that, there's actually a lot more history there than you can imagine. Um, even before LibreOffice, there was obviously uh, actually open office and further back in time, and back and back, eventually we were able to start writer and each of these have introduced both, some of which are still with us. Uh, so at the top here, the two repositories which are still useful, which are sparse repositories, the fourth we all repository, because it goes further back in time than any of the others, and uh, the daily debug tool repository, because uh, we don't have any of those on them yet, which covers the 5.1 uh, region. So thanks to the logical What can't we do with the set? Excellent. Uh, very old commits, as I just showed you anything before about the Office 3.5 was stuck in more than one way. The reason why we don't have good big set coverage or any big set coverage for that is because uh, source that old is very hard to build these days. It's more a matter of archaeology than development. In order to build uh, the tree that old, you need to set up a um, development environment from that era. The modern GCC and other tools just won't cut it. They don't like the, the, the code as it was then. And of course, anything on the release branches, as you can say, only cover master. It does happen very occasionally that someone will introduce a bug on the release branch, but it shouldn't happen because uh, all the commits on there should first have landed on master. And from time to time, we hope it doesn't, not a very important thing to cover, but perhaps we will cover it in the future. Which should you use? Use the point range repositories if you can, because that will give you an exact result if there's one to be had. Only if your 
outside of that region and how to use uh, a sparse repository. There are other historical repositories, many of which are listed in the wiki. Uh, try to ignore them unless you really, really have to should be relevant. And finally, there is a special repository which some people have used for binary um, bisection incorrectly, and that is the releases repository, which contains only the official uh, document foundation releases plus one. I'm actually it was released before all of them. Um, don't use that for the section, it's not helpful. That's why I left it off the diagram. Right, so, we have a bit of time, because that's the now the main part of my talk. How to do it effectively. I can't teach you how to do this in this because it's a talk and not a demonstration. If you'd like a demonstration, please come and find me at the Hackfest and I'll show you. What I hope to do in this is to give you some ideas of how to think about it if you have to find a regression using binary bisection. Firstly, what is the idea of effective? Uh, essentially, it means you have to find a single commit, or failing that sometimes, a small set of commits by a single person is also a good result. Uh, then you need to get that to the person who produced it. And most importantly, you need to do it in a shorter period of time as possible after the bug was introduced. Very often, people disappear. They leave the project, or they go and join a commune, or generally go and can't reach them anymore, they don't care about their bugs. If you can get a bug to the person who's used it within a few weeks or months, there's a very good chance that they will be willing and able to fix it. And that is something we strive for very hard in QA. And even if you don't get a good result, um, documenting what you find on the Bugzilla report will certainly save other QA and developers time because you've seen your result. So please do. Uh, so, the first part, before we start, the most important thing for uh, running a binary bisection is that you need to have solid reproduction steps. And if you don't, then there's nothing to do. Uh, simply send it back to the user who reported it and ask for more details. Uh, that's what the need info status is for on Bugzilla. Uh, because you're going to be doing the same thing a number of times, it's helpful at this point to make sure that your reproduction steps are as simple as possible. If you have trouble reproducing it at all, a good thing to do is to start with a version that is as near as possible to the version that the user reported it on. Uh, if you can't even reproduce it then, then again, yeah, you need to send it back for more information. Uh, another important thing to do before starting is to check that the bug still exists on master. Now, if it doesn't, there may still be work to do. Um, it is useful, <coughs> if you find a bug that used to exist, it doesn't anymore, to find out exactly when it was fixed. The reason for this is that from time to time, someone will fix a bug tangentially. They fixed it, but they didn't know they fixed it, or didn't know, for instance, that it caused a crash. Uh, when this happens, it's very good thing to check that a fix that has been made has made it on all relevant branches. So that, for instance, if it was fixed on master, has it been made into the latest stable release? Very good thing to check. Um, so if you are simplifying your reproduction steps, a good thing to do is to make a test document as late in the process as possible. If the user reported that you have to do a dozen things and the final one is the one that causes the crash, make a test document at the point just before then so that you don't have to do each of those each time you reproduce. Okay. That's you. Uh, another one that comes up from time to time, uh, reproducing a bug period by running a macro. You'll get very bored of going through... I'm 10 minutes now, but I don't have a chance to run the next one. So, hold on, there's a lot of information. It's very welcome to be on one and can still be new books on one. It's also still possible to learn much later. In 15 minutes, library staff will no longer be available in the library or at the information desk. You're welcome to stay in the area and use the library on your own. <laughs> so, if you have to run a macro to reproduce bugs and it pulls the crash, for instance, uh, you'll quickly get very bored of running through the menus and dialogues to find the right macro. Uh, a quick shortcut to do that is you can insert a button into a document which runs the macro. That way you can just load the button and press the button and you're done. Uh, 
another common thing to reproduce a bug is that um, there is a problem with loading and saving certain file formats. There's an excellent shortcut for that, which is to use the command line conversion tool, uh, where you headless is a useful switch for some historical versions, it's not necessary anymore, and to you simply tell it to convert to the relevant format your input file. Hello, question by me. Uh, it's just more a note that uh, um, in most of the cases this is not relevant, but um, the, when you use this convert too, yes. uh, you have uh, LibreOffice has to map the file name extension to a okay. filter. And uh, this code is not shared with the code that uh, maps the file extension to a filter uh, in the file save as dialog. Okay. So uh, sometimes it happens that um, the file save us will result in a different result com compared to this convert to. Okay. That's so if something, something, something really that... strange goes on, okay. this is something to watch out for. So you um, have to apparently take care that the resulting file is of the right format. What something I was aware of. Uh, very good. No, thank you. <laughs> it, it should work. Uh... Most of the times, uh, <laughs> but sometimes what you can do is you can also specify what filter you want to use. Okay, there is also a switch to specify the exact Yeah, you can actually say docket and, and uh, loss of noise here. Just yeah, like and if you want to do some of the zone 3, you can specify that. <coughs> you can actually specify the filter name as well. Okay, For so, thank you. Uh, moving rapidly on, because we all like to get to the uh, <laughs> So, next part, setting up the previous set. Um, you need to find your commit that works and one that doesn't. A very important thing to do is to make sure you actually check these. You'd be surprised how often you get that, people get that wrong. If you don't check that you've got one that works and one that doesn't, what will most likely happen is that you'll get the start or the end of a Vivizet repository, which is a useless result, it doesn't tell you anything. Um, a very good thing to do is to find a specific epoch which contains the bug. So if you can narrow it down to having been introduced in the development period for a certain release, there will be a uh, specific fine-grained repository for most of those now between uh, 4.1 and 1.0. Um, one important reason you should do that is it does also happen from time to time that the same bug occurs more than once or one that looks very like it. Because the uh, git by set will only give you a single result, if you give it too big a region without a good cause, uh, you may get an old bug rather than the latest bug. It does happen, I had to educate someone about that just uh, a couple of weeks ago. So while you're asking to follow the movie section, do make sure you follow the reproduction steps, even I have fallen over this from time to time. If you're not sure exactly what you're testing, you don't get the same result. Um, a common thing that happens is that you find that some commits uh, in the process uh, are present, but they can't be tested. So you can start them and the graphics will fall on its face, or simply uh, for some other reason you can't test what you want to test. If there are just a few of these, you can use uh, the git by set skip command to jump straight over them. The problem is, if underlying that there are a hundred commits, you have to end up testing all hundred of those individually before it will tell you there's nothing more to test. You usually don't want to do that, it will take a long time. What you should do when you find that more than three or four skips have happened in a row is to stop and start again. You turn your single by section into two. Uh, so you now want to find the first, the uh, point at which uh, the originally working behavior uh, turned into something you can't test, and then secondly, between where you can't test and where it's definitely broken, and record those both on the bugs of the bug. Uh, once you've finished, one other very important thing to do is to recheck your results. Um, again, from a bit of personal experience, if you don't do this, you may, may end up committing the wrong person as the guilty party. Um, there are a couple of reasons this can happen. The most obvious is your error. If you type good when you meant bad, then you will land in the wrong place. But it can also can and does happen that um, you don't notice 
uh, the bug you'll be producing isn't quite as big as you thought as you thought. If it crashes, maybe it only crashes nine out of every ten times. And if you don't notice this, you may again land on the wrong commit and play the wrong person. So it's very good at the end to recheck that the result you've got actually is the correct result. When we get to the end, there are one, several things that are possible as your result. The very best one, the one we like most, is that we have a, a proper fine grained coverage and we found a single commit. We can send it the order, job done and finished. Um, if we get a range of skipped commits in the fine grained repository, it's also possible that if they're all by one person and this person has done a, a set of commits together, but didn't bother to make sure that they can all be built individually, that uh, if that's the case, then we can still send it to that person. If we are in a sparse region, we don't have uh, full coverage, then someone will still need to look more at the results later, unfortunately, but this is still a, uh, a useful shortcut for whoever is going to do the next piece of work. And uh, finally, if we have uh, sparse results and a range of skip commits, this is probably a long build failure yeah, and we're in trouble, that's going to take a lot of work to track down. We really hope we don't get that. Uh, so, if we found our perfect result, uh, what we need to do is to adjust the fields in Bozilla. Uh, two possible things can happen here, because just sometimes, uh, when a new feature is introduced, the new feature and the bug with it arrive at the same time. We don't consider that a regression. If the feature didn't exist before the bug, it's not really a regression, and somebody will complain about that. Somebody might get that, probably, but that's what's going to happen. So we have a special. Two minutes left, but any longer than that, we'll try to find the support for the new information. So, my dear, come to the other side and we'll get started with the new piece of the puzzle. Det er også stadig muligt at lunde mig sager. In 5 minutes, library staff will no longer be available in the library or at the information desk. You're welcome to stay in the area and use the library on your own. For what second, I'm going to take it to mean that I'm going to grab this up in 5 minutes. It's, it's, it's fine. Uh, so, for this specific case, we have a special whiteboard tag in Bugzilla, which is implementation error, which is just for the case when a bug and a feature arrive at the same time, and there's no earlier version that worked. Uh, we can still find this using the right section, but uh, the tags on the bugs version are different. Um, so, a uh, small thing to note is that uh, in a Git repository, the author and the committer of a uh, commit may be different, and you need to make sure you're sending it to the right one. Sometimes the committer is the reviewer, you really want to be sending it to the author. Uh, generally, uh, you want to make sure that also that you're not sending your bugs to the biggest that frequent builder. They'll be mentioned there, but that's not the right answer. The correct author and committer are in the body of the commit message, which is copied over from the source repository when the biggest that repo is built. Uh, some also, it sometimes also occurs less so now for reasons that should be obvious to anyone who has been paying attention that we have commits that are copied over from OpenOffice. It's not a good idea to contact the author in this case, usually addresses at apache.org. However, given that Armand Grant is now working at CIP, there is now a major exception to this, and possibly now a good thing to copy to, copy to him again. Um, Armand Grant is, of course, one of the major <laughs> previous contributors to OpenOffice. Uh, so, in fact, a large majority of the ones that copy over do have his name. Uh, if you're trying to find who to send the bug to in Bugzilla, not everyone uses the same email address. But Bugzilla is a useful feature for this. You just type their name in the CC box, very likely the correct address will pop up. A few people don't have accounts on Bugzilla. Uh, in this case, just want to do it. Uh, now, Typical instructions for what to do with the bootstrap involve sticking with a lot of git by set block or the, uh, on, a, on a comment. Uh, if we narrow it down to a single commit, it's probably not useful to do that. Don't bother, it's just noise on the bug. If we can't 
uh, an important thing not to do is to add the bisected keyword, which is purely for the case when we have identified a single commit, or at least a single person. Um, if you leave that off, then it makes it perfectly clear there is still work to do on this bug, and QA can find it later to carry on. And unless you are certain, reasonably certain, who has introduced the bug, don't CC them. Um, especially if you're dealing with a sparse repository, uh, someone will be mentioned on the result. But considering that most of the source commits aren't mentioned at all, they probably aren't the right person. So don't bother with that. Um, now, in the case earlier, I mentioned that sometimes you need to know how to find a bug that's fixed. Git by set doesn't like to do this, it's backwards. It always wants the uh, bad commit to follow the good commit. But normally, as you think of it, the good one is the one that works. So you have to turn your brain around in this case and make uh, the uh, initial good commit the one that has the bug and the bad commit the one that's to be fixed. I find it useful to hold Shakespeare in mind when I'm doing this and to repeat to myself, fair is foul and foul is fair. Each time I'm typing good Git by set, by set good or bad. Just think of Macbeth. Um, specific tips for specific purposes. Uh, anyone who uses the old 4-3-all uh, learning repository, which goes a long way back in time, it still has its uses, may notice that it has a few small issues. Um, the, there in some commits, there are files in the repository which shouldn't be there. And you will find that when you type git by set good or git by set bad, it will refuse to continue, continue until you move out of the way. And a single by section is going to happen a lot of times. You probably want to take a shortcut to sort it out. You can manually delete them if you really want to. Um, if you're certain that there's nothing sitting in the directory which you really care about, you can simply type instead git clean minus dffx, which will reset the repository to how it should be, but also delete anything in the directory that was. Uh, not in the repository. Um, a useful tool which a lot of people don't know about, Git by Set Visualize, shows in graphical form the state of a Git by Set. You can also access the same tool using the Git pay command, and it takes all sorts of Git like commands to show ranges of commits in the graphical form. Books um, like this. It it has its uses. Another useful case for using it is uh, if you get to the end of a bisection and you've only got skipped results, you didn't find a specific commit, Git will tell you which are the skipped commits, but it won't tell you in specific order, they're in random order. It's not useful. If at this point you can use Git by set visualize, you can quickly figure out which is the first and which is the last in this range, which is a very useful thing to tell people uh, who need to look at that result. Um, Git is not generally capable of moving forward in history, it likes to go backwards. But there is a very useful uh, little command which I'm going to give you here. If you want to move one forward in history towards uh, master or towards latest, in the case of a uh, binary by set repository, uh, you can do this and it will go forward in time. It's a useful thing to do when you are rechecking a result. You might want to go forward to backwards a couple of times to check it. Um, I make these into little uh, shell scripts, which I call git forward and bb forward. I use that almost every time I have to do a bit by section. Uh, if you would like any further information, there is a large and moderately organized collection of information on the uh, Document Foundation Wiki. If you'd like some more personal help, please come and find me anytime on the uh, LibreOffice QA IRC channel. Be delighted to help you. There are other people in there with some experience as well. And that's it, and we can go for our supper. Any questions, no good. <laughs> <laughs> please. Yeah, so I always wondered, uh, why is it called BB set? Uh, it's short for binary biset. But I thought uh, a section so was a section and bisect was a binary section. Uh, so sections. playing git bisect works on the source repository. And uh, okay. um, for each commit you test, you first have to build from source. That can take a long time. Even with uh, quite good 
consumer hardware that can take an hour to build a lever office and you might have to do that ten times to find your buck. Uh, by building binaries ahead of time, giving them to everybody equally, um, you simply have to check out the binary for the correct source commit and test that and it will take a few minutes rather than an hour or probably several hours unless you've got really, really good hardware. Uh, so the binary is not exactly two, but it's actually the source of the binary. Um, so the, the one uh, buy uh, is for the binary, binary the 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 buy is for the binary yes. search. Yeah. Down. You can expand it to binary, binary section. Yes, if you want to. If you, if you would like to see this in action, please drop into the Hackfest and I'd be delighted to demonstrate it. Okay, thanks very much. Let's go and get some supper.